Alliance, Manchester Business School. Thank you, Sam, and um, thank you indeed for the invitation. I have to say, I feel a bit of a fraud in here because I teach my students about innovation, but I don't do innovation. You are the guys, you are the heroes here, so bear with me. And um, so I'm, I'm really, indeed, really happy to be uh, uh, here in this event. It's really exciting. Um, there's all these creative juices flowing. Um, so. I'm going to present something that is very linked to what we've been hearing about. And it's about innovation districts. We have heard about innovation districts already and what is happening in Manchester. And it, this is, of course, not a new phenomenon. A lot of cities are doing this. Um, but we actually know very little about it. Uh, so this is work that we're starting to do with some colleagues at Alliance Manchester Business School, where I'm based, including my colleague, uh, Professor Phil Sapira, and other colleagues, and also in conjunction with uh, the universities of uh, Melbourne and also um, expanding our partnership with, with uh, Toronto uh, University, where similar um, f developments are taking place. So we're seeking to learn from others. So, when you hear about the innovation, when you hear the word innovation, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Um, it's probably some, some gadget or an app or some of the really creative solutions that we were hearing about uh, a, a few minutes um, earlier today. Um, you probably think about companies such as Google or Tesla, or you probably think about places such as Silicon Valley or Boston. So you'll be right in thinking that, you know, innovation is related to all of these things, right? Innovation is a set of activities or a process uh, of uh, inventing things or research and development in, in organizations. is also um, out outputs of these processes, right? Uh, in terms of new or improved goods and services that perhaps make our lives easier or more productive um, or more entertaining even. Um, so, Sumpeter, who you might have heard of, he was a famous economist who was the first to write about innovation. He referred to innovations as new combinations. And I think this is really interesting because it's about combining ideas, is uh, it's about novelty, it's about thinking differently, more creatively, right? And this can lead to new and wonderful things. So, innovation also happens in places. So, you probably thought about very innovative places such as Silicon Valley, who is home to um, many of the world's biggest uh, high-tech companies. Um, this is a really, I recommend this book, who talks about the history of Silicon Valley, very, very interesting. Well, you probably thought about Boston and the area around MIT in Kendall Square, um, which is also um, home and is a very uh, big ecosystem of companies. Um, and mainly in biotechnology, so one of the densest and more complex kind of ecosystems, uh, in innovation ecosystems in the world. And this, the point I want to make here is that innovation is um, clustering space, right? It happens in some places and not others. Um, and some places uh, have certain conditions, certain uh, elements, certain environments. Um, that make them more conducive to innovation. I mean, if you see in these graphs here, um, they depict the concentration of things like patents and publications, of uh, academic publications in the US, and you see that it's really spiky. So it tends to be concentrated in particular areas, right? So innovations happen in particular places. And what we want to know is why and why places are more or less innovative. Um, so, the fact that innovation happens in places and there is a geography to innovation is, of course, not new. 
and already um, scholars or well, uh, people like Alfred Marshall, you probably also heard that name, an economist who was writing in the 19th century, he was describing what he was seeing in uh, industrial Britain at the time, what was happening in Manchester with textile industry or Sheffield with uh, um, uh, steel industry. And he was seeing that there was a concentration of companies that were specialized in doing similar things. Um, and this was leading to wonderful things in terms of greater uh, competitiveness. It was making firms more productive by being close to each other. And he was like, wow, this is amazing. Uh, he referred to that as industrial districts, right? And he said that by being concentrated and close to one another, uh, companies were able to um, share resources uh, and inputs, but also uh, pool of workers, talented workers that were concentrated there, but also share of ideas, what we now call knowledge spillovers. He said that um, there was something in the air that was making these companies really uh, productive and it was uh, uh, this kind of sharing of, of knowledge that was allowed by proximity. Um, now, after this kind of in industrial districts that happened especially in Britain in, in the 19th century. Then we saw the model of Silicon Valley kind of take off. And this was a different model. This was kind of taking place in like suburban areas, green uh, uh, areas outside of the cities. And then this model of Silicon Valley, because everybody wanted to be like Silicon Valley, right? Uh, they started to build um, technology parks after Stanford uh, um, Park. Um, and the model of the Technopole kind of uh, started to become really popular uh, and everybody was building technology parks everywhere like Sofia and Tripolis and places like that but then what happened a few decades later is it was a rediscovery of the cities and urban spaces and in cities um, what happens is a little bit different and you probably have heard of the urban economist and activist Jane Jacobs. She was passionate about cities. She thought cities were amazing. They were, uh, they were like living organisms and they have the diversity and, and the lively um, and intensity that make them have the seeds of their own regeneration and they were able to reinvent themselves. And this is because cities are diverse and they are big, right? So if you have a lot of activities and very diverse activities, the likelihood of those new combinations to happen are greater, right? Um, so cities were also highlighted by people like Richard Florida, who was talking about the three T's. He was talking about technology, talent and tolerance. If you have those in your city, you're gonna attract cool people, creative people, and, and uh, you know, you're going to have more innovations and, and more uh, prosperity. And so these, if you like, are the seeds to this idea of innovation districts, the combination of agglomeration, a collocation of companies, but also in urban spaces, right? And this has become a, a very popular model these days, even though uh, scholars are still struggling to understand what it really means. And it started with places like, okay, so yes, so we moving from uh, suburban kind of technology parks to urban areas. So that was my message there. Um, so we start to see innovation districts everywhere, right? Uh, every city wants to be an innovation district, including, of course, Manchester. Um, the first innovation district, people tend to think it was in the US in Boston, but actually it was in Barcelona. The first strategy to deliberately create an innovation district was in, in Barcelona, in Poble Nou. Uh, it was an area that was um, um, specialized or, or there was a big textile industry, but it was in decline. Um, they got together, they major and, and, and uh, private partners, what do we do about this area? You know, we're losing all these jobs, it's terrible. And they thought, well, we could, kind of change it to, towards tourism and, and things like that. Well, Barcelona is already a very touristic city, so that would have been the obvious thing. But I thought, 
Well, no, let's try to um, create a space for innovation, for uh, support of the knowledge economy, attract talent, attract investment, um, create uh, support companies. And, and this is how the Cano Barcelona uh, initiative came about. And it kind of was quite successful. Um, and after that, uh, other cities and other places um, follow suit. Um, it's difficult to know how many innovation districts are there. I mean, if you look at Google, um, it's like more than 80, but actually it's a lot more than that. Um, there are already more than 90 in the US. Um, in a report by the Connected Cities Catapult, they refer to five, more than 500 kind of, of these initiatives. Um, but of course, they're very diverse. So you can have um, um, hubs that are like districts or neighborhoods or corridors, all sorts of names to refer to kind of similar idea. And they might be around, let's say, a university. So that's one type. They might be uh, reimagined urban areas, like what I mentioned in Barcelona. Or they might be kind of slightly more urbanized models of science parks. So there are all these typologies of, of the, this kind of phenomenon. Um, and there have been also different definitions, mainly by kind of think tanks uh, uh, helping uh, um, promoting these activities. Um, and one of them is geographical areas where leading edge anchor institutions and companies cluster and connect with startups, business incubators and accelerators. So this is like what we want, right, in innovation districts. And it's also intimately linked with the idea of innovation ecosystems. Um, and so, what is that you want in, in an innovation district? So in order to maximize those kind of spillovers I was talking about, uh, you need to have, or you want to have a kind of dense ecosystem of big companies, uh, small companies, startups, um, that are also connected with knowledge hubs, and they are helped by intermediaries that act as kind of boundary spanners or connectors between or, or animators of these ecosystems. And in order for that to happen, you also want some kind of softer elements around quality of life, the quality of uh, the, the public realm, amenities, cultural activities, and, and so on. Um, and of course, things like access to finance, super important access to talent. You want to uh, be able to attract people or uh, hire people. Um, places where you can both live, work and play. This is something that Jane Jacobs talked about, cool cities and, and, and uh, thriving cities are places where you want to work, when you want to live and you want to um, play. So uh, all those elements need to be uh, in, in, in place. And of course, spaces for new networking um, uh, for those kind of spillovers and, 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 and new combinations to happen. But not everything is good, and there is a bit of a dark side to um, innovation districts. Um, and this is happening, this is, has been observed in a number of initiatives worldwide. So first of all, who benefits? It tends to be the well-educated, the, the people with access to um, uh, funding and, and, and talent. Um, it's often a real estate-dominated activity um, rather than building communities. So, you know, that soft aspect of, of inclusiveness is often comes uh, secondary. So this has been observed in a number of cities around the world. And this is something that Manchester Zoo kind of tried to prevent, right? Gentrification is a common critique to innovation districts. So the effect of displacing uh, residents that were already there, or even the um, entrepreneurs and communities that were kind of we're trying to help in the first place. Sometimes they are priced out of the, of the housing market. Sometimes they're concentrated, the effects are concentrated in, in the central area, not spread out in broader neighborhoods. We think of these as sustainable activities, right? They're urban, you don't need cars, you rely on public transport, but often the reliance on cars is difficult to get rid of, right? 
Um, so that often doesn't happen. Um, innovation, yeah, innovation is great, but innovation is not necessarily um, synonymous with um, social development. Um, so we want not just more innovation, but better innovation that improves people's lives um, in a wider sense. Um, the issue of who governs uh, innovation districts, who decides, who's on board, are we being inclusive? That's another element that we want to uh, consider. Um, Brad Delusion refers to the idea that if everybody's in innovation districts, innovation districts are so pervasive, then what, is, what makes, and makes us distinctive, right? Uh, so there's a risk that we, it starts to become something that is meaningless. Um, and the other thing that has happened in the last couple of years, I don't know if you noticed, two or three years, COVID, um, which is in a way the opposite of innovation districts. Um, so it challenges the core idea of innovation districts that proximity sparks innovation. And what has happened in the last few years is that we stuck at home, we do no shopping online, we uh, increasingly, um, you know, business travel has started to resume uh, recently, but things stopped and people are not uh, uh, placed near to each other in, in proximity. So, the, and even some people have moved to uh, out, outside of the cities to have more space and so on. So how can we reconcile innovation districts with what's happened in, in, in during COVID pandemic? Are we able to go back to that proximity um, situations or uh, how do we rethink innovation districts? So I think innovation districts, I mean, they're a great idea, but we need to obviously consider the drawbacks and prevent them. Um, but also, after the pandemic, there might be certain things that we need to think about. Um, so how we return um, to uh, and rebuild trust in proximity, how we reconnect people, but also how are we more relevant? We learned during the pandemic that uh, innovation and, and urban spaces uh, can make in, uh, inequalities worse and social exclusion. How do we make innovation districts more relevant and mission oriented? So we think about not just more innovation, but better innovation, more inclusive innovation. Um, so there are things around how do we design innovation districts in the first place? Uh, who do we include? How to make sure that the innovation that is uh, realized, that is promoted, um, considers these social challenges, and also how do we spread the benefits of innovation more broadly. Um, so, innovation districts will, I think, uh, and in Manchester, as, as is starting to develop this idea, will need to include these elements of sustainability, innovation, um, inclusive governance, in, in its consideration of um, the innovation districts and how do we consider success, right? Is more innovation or is it making people's lives better? Um, how do we use uh, decision making that is more inclusive around um, funding, around public procurement and, and things like that? How do we um, ensure there are living wage uh, spaces? How do we link to um, training and, and, um, uh, and uh, education provision, so that is a more kind of inclusive um, uh, activities. And so I'll leave you with these two ideas. First, it is a bit difficult to, um, to kind of uh, recover from this, the COVID pandemic. And there are a lot of rigidities, um, and we, it's a tendency to go back to normal, uh, back to uh, the old normal. But that wasn't that great. So, we, as we think about innovation districts, how do we learn the lessons from the pandemic and um, bring them to to this kind of uh, idea? 
Um, and how do we make them more mission oriented? How do we make them more, um, how would uh, in, in embed this idea of directionality in the innovations and activities that are being promoted towards more socially um, inclusive and, and sustainable innovations? So um, that's it. I don't. I forgot to put a final slide with my email, <laughs> so it's not like you, you can't contact me. But you can uh, find me easily on LinkedIn or on our website. So thank you. A uh, huge thank you for coming and uh, for taking part and, and giving us that wonderful speech. Um, there were a few questions actually on Slido, Elvira. So if you don't mind, we will share them with you, and then we can post them.